Father, we come before you. We thank you for your word. Little guys are excited to sing Christmas carols because they're excited for presents. They'll find something with their name on it. And for all of us who are here, Lord, every day of our life, there's been a gift with their name on it called forgiveness, salvation, eternal life, a full heart. And like those little kids, it has to be received and opened. And so as we enter into the Christmas season, I pray that the simple exchanging of gifts would drive home to the hearts that have yet to receive you, that you've been waiting for them. And you'll gladly receive all who come to you by faith. So bless this time in your word, Lord. Open it to our hearts afresh now in the second service. And Lord, thank you for your great faithfulness in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go to chapter 2, verse 1. A little running start, in case you missed last week. But I determined this, <clears throat> excuse me, within myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry... Who is he then that maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow of them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all, that they would do the right thing is the idea, that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, 1 Corinthians as well as a visit we'll get into, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. But if any has caused grief, he did, he's not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is the punishment which was inflicted of many. They tossed him out. They wouldn't eat with him. He needs to give right. So that contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him and to comfort him lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For I forgive anything, if I do, to whom I forgave it for your sakes in the person of Christ on his behalf. is literally what it says. The idea of person of Christ. Lest Satan should get advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So that's where we were last week. Now verse 12, we pick up. Furthermore, when I came to Troas, now for those who hate geography, tune out. But Troas is, if you have Turkey, nation of Turkey, Syria, Turkey, it's the far west north side of Turkey where you literally can just jump over and head into northern Greece known as Macedonia. So it's literally right on the edge there as you would make your journey out of Turkey and head over to Europe. Many people do it as refugees, as things have happened throughout the Middle East. So, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened unto me of the Lord. God was moving. The idea is to loose or open. Door was opened to me of the Lord. But I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence crossing over, into Macedonia. Wait a second. When has Paul ever backed down from a chance to preach? How many have heard of Eutychus? You to what? Eutychus. Who's he? Remember the guy at midnight? <clears throat> Paul starts preaching midnight. He falls out of the window, third floor, goes down, lands on the ground. Paul runs down, lays his hands on him, either healed him or revived him from the dead, one or the other. Paul goes back up and preached till dawn. He's fine. Let's get back to it. So for Paul to leave an opportunity to preach means he's really troubled. Taking my leave of them, I went in from thence to Macedonia. Verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which I'll... Wait a second. Do you detect a slight change in tone? From verse 13. Are you guys awake? How many detect a tone change? You're thinking, what happened? You just had Thanksgiving, yes? Good. Do you have family members who, while telling a story, will digress? And you're like, oh. And some get so far out there, they're like, what was I talking about again? <laughs> First service, we all understand this collectively. You start a story, you're getting into something, you're like, where am I going with this? You know, if you've begun to inherit that blessing of time, 
You know what I mean? There are times I've been teaching and I'm, I'm teaching, I'm reading. You guys are listening to me reading my mind. I'm like, where, where was I? Where am I going with this? You have no idea what goes on. But anyway, <laughs> Paul takes a digression. He's so happy for what resulted that he digresses big time. How far did he digress? From chapter 2 to chapter 7. Man, that's a serious digression. Now, you might say, well, what's the point of pointing this out? Well, it's actually important because when you read things Paul wrote, Paul has no problem taking a side journey to elucidate on some piece of information. So, for example, when he says, you offer before the Lord, your works are judged, 1 Corinthians 3. If any man has wood, hay, or stubble, it is going to be destroyed by that fire of judgment. Yet he himself will be saved as through fire. So you have no reward for how you spent your time here knowing Christ, but you will be in eternity with Christ. If there was ever a time to take a digression and say, doggone it, church, you build with wood, hay, and stubble, you're out. He doesn't. He says you'll lose reward. Same thing in 1 Corinthians 5. We covered that last week. A man has his father's wife. He's in an affair with his stepmother. What does he tell them? Throw him out. Deliver such a one out there to the world, to Satan, for the destruction of the flesh, that their spirit might be saved. If there was ever a time to take another major digression and say, you do this, you're out. Or you're going to come under correction. But keep that in mind as you read through some key texts that Paul wrote. He could have said a lot, and he doesn't, which means he means what he says. So I just want to point that out. But, of course, for us to pick up on this, you now have to go to chapter 7, verse 5, to figure out what, what did he digress from. So he said, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, there was a door opened to me of the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Verse 5, look at this. When we were coming to Macedonia, he's back to his main theme, our flesh had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Boy, you thought that was just you in this modern era. We were troubled on every side. Without were fightings. Now, we know they were arguing at Corinth. He's already tried to deal with that. But there may be more going on than we realize. He may have had people in his entourage who said, shouldn't have written that letter. We don't know. Without were fightings. We could have done this better. Second guessing. Isn't that a real joy to do to yourself? Without were fightings. Within were fears. Even Paul. What happened? Will they listen? Nevertheless, God that comforteth. How many went back and listened to chapter 1 and chapter 2 after last week, realizing you're good in the back, gold star, come see me later. Um, comfort was the whole beginning of chapter 1. You go through trials, God comforts you. Why? So you can comfort others. There's a reason why he does it. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus, not by his coming only, but also by the consolation, that comfort wherewith he was comforted in you. How many remember COVID? <laughs> yeah, one hand over there. You guys get out much? Well, you remember it was, you know, what, March 2020, if I get it correct, right? And uh, two weeks, we'll flatten the curve. Two weeks. You mean 104 weeks? We'll flatten the curve. And in the beginning, rightly so, we didn't know what we were dealing with. Everybody cleared out, you know, so I started teaching an empty room. Do you know how hard it is to teach an empty room, try to make it look normal? <laughs> that was a challenge. But people figured out eventually, one, well, anyway, and two, they figured out the back door wasn't locked. So little by little, people would sneak in. People were like, hey, we, hey, the word's out. I'm like, shh. But eventually, we, we, had, we had quite a bit, and we're like, you have to sit off camera. That's all we're asking. Just don't let people, because people be, you know, they'll throw a fit and all that. So little by little, people are finding out and all that. And then eventually, we went outside and, and all, you know, you, you lived it, and you know. But some people, Resurrection Sunday, two years later, was the first time they came back in church. 
They'd say, oh, we were live streaming and we've kept up, you know, and all that. We know where you're going. It was the first time they came back. We watched over those two years people coming back. And one thing I saw, Pastor Steve saw it as well, as they're in during worship, we would see people crying because they realized how much they missed being among God's people, singing in person God's praise. They didn't realize how much they missed sitting in church until they had a chance to come back. In other words, they were comforted by the presence of other believers, and they didn't realize how much they missed it. We still have some families that still live stream. They haven't come back. That's what they do. They're like, yeah, we're out here. Okay, fine. You, you run your family as you think you should, but the folks who've come back are like, man, I didn't realize how much I missed it. Yeah, and then, of course, someone sits in their chair because they've been gone for two years, and they had to, you know, they had to grow through that challenge. But when you're in a tough trial and another believer shows up and encourages you, it's huge. That forsaking of the fellowship one to another is a problem. You get, Satan gets you isolated, he takes you down. That's how he works. He's like a roaring lion. Study the lions. He gets something alone, they strangle it, snuff it out. So by the coming of Titus, we were comforted. Not by his coming only. Great to see the Corinthians didn't, you know, skewer him and burn him alive. That was good. Not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you that these guys got some things right. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning over what they allowed, waking up to what was going on. Your fervent mind toward me, rather than hating Paul, they realized Paul's right, we need to get right, so better listen, so that I rejoice the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not mela, meta melamai. You try it, meta melamai. Try it again, meta melamai. Great. What does that mean? That means to change one's mind or purpose after doing something regrettable. How many of you have had a personal metamelami at some point in your life? <laughs> the rest of you are lying and regret you didn't raise your hand. Yeah, that's nice, but can you, can you help us to understand how the word's used? Sure. Turn to Matthew 27. Matthew 27, verse 1. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. They tried to put a veneer of legality over a full council decision, but there's a lot of rules they're breaking. We don't have time for that. When they had bound him, they led him away and they delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, met him all I, regretted. Yeah, but it's translated repented. It's meta melamai. He regretted a course of action he took. to regret something that you've done. <laughs> he repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver, which, by the way, is prophesied, to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I betrayed the innocent blood. And they said to him, what is that to us? See thou to it. In other words, sounds like a personal problem, buddy. And he cast down the pieces of silver, as prophesied, in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Metamelamai. Peter denied the Lord three times. Perhaps you've read that. Luke's gospel tells us the third time he denied as the rooster's crowing, he turns and looks, and guess whose eyes meet his? Jesus. Oh. And he went out and wept bitterly, but he came back to the apostles. Judas, Metamelamite, went out and hung himself. What do we need to know the difference? Next verse. For though I made you sorry, with a letter, verse 8, Back in our chapter, or now technically back in our digression. 2 Corinthians 7, 8. Clutch in, first gear, let's go. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not metamelamai regret. I do not repent, though I did metamelamai regret. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry. It did. Though you were sorry, though it were before a season. So it made you sorry, but it made you think. And that's where things begin to happen. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, that wasn't the point, but that you sorrowed to metanoia. Try that one. Metanoia, metamelomai, to regret a course of action or whatever, sorrowful, 
metanoia to change the mind, to change the direction. It involves a change of mind, which has a subsequent change of action. In other words, that's what we mean by repentance. When I repent, it means I realize I'm out of order, and I've now realized I've got to get right with God. In other words, a 180-degree turn from being offensive to God to seeking God. That's repentance. Metanoia. All these metas are annoying. Yeah, well, that's fine, but they're important to know. Metamelamai, metanoia, right? So this is a true change of mind. Not that you were made sorry, but that you repented, right? That you were sorry to repentance, metanoia. That you were made sorry after a godly manner. That you might receive damage by us in nothing. So they, for godly sorrow, when you realize what you do and how you behave is an offense to God who created the heavens and the earth. Godly sorrow worketh to metanoia, repentance. Which, by the way, when you repent and realize you're a sinner, it brings you to salvation. Not to be repented of. That's regret. But of the sorrow of the world, that works death. See, the sorrow of the world is sorry because they got caught. Oh, you know that one. Metanoia is, I am an offense to God, and if I don't want to die in my sins, i got to turn around and ask his forgiveness. There's an eternal difference between the two. Many people are sorry for how they've lived, but not enough to realize I've offended God and I need to ask his forgiveness. Big difference. Okay. Godly sorrow worketh to repentance, to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this self-same thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort. Now, I get asked this all the time. An offense happens. Last week we talked about affairs. I'm not suggesting you get into it, but we talked about affairs and all that and the idea of you know, repentance and someone gets right and then you've got to forgive. But in the course of dealing with something like that, I get asked all the time, well, Pastor Chris, how, how do I know they're really repentant? So an easy working definition I've come up with is this. Having lived in Moscow, spent some time in Mexico, watched television in both countries, uh, and, you know, as my Spanish or my Russian was quite base at that point, real repentance is like watching a foreign film with no subtitles, but you get it. Like, wow, that's obvious. That's what real repentance is. It's not, do you think, are they, mm, it, you know, it's obvious. Okay, well, what are the signs of obvious? Nice, that's our verse. So here he says to them, you've repented godly sorrow, not to be repented of. Verse 11, behold, this self-same thing you sorrowed after a godly sort, number one, what carefulness it wrought in you or earnestness. And that is, I don't want to be an offense any longer. I am out of order. I need to get this right. Number one, what carefulness it brought in you. Second, what clearing of yourselves. In other words, as much as you can, making it right. Are you an apology? Or here, I owe you this, or whatever it is. So number one, got to get away from it. Number two, as much as I can, make it right. Clearing of yourselves. And by the way, in the case of an affair, that means you are 100% as translucent as glass accountable. No more hiding. What carefulness it wrought. What clearing of yourselves. Yea, one indignation. How could I have been so blind? How could I have gotten so stuck in this? How could I have wounded so much the people I say I love? Indignation. What? What? If you've been there, you know. What indignation. Okay. What zeal. I'm not going back. What revenge. That's vindication or avenging of wrong. Completely the opposite behavior of the wrong. I'm out. I'm done. I'm out. In all things, you've approved yourselves to be clear in this manner. So in other words, you guys, by your actions, no subtitles needed. You're clearly upset that you let this happen. You realize it's out of order before God, and you have dealt with this a properly way and the proper way for sake of God's church. In other words, not in a way so happy. You guys actually did it right. And all things you've shown yourselves or have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, he's his own problem, nor for his cause that suffered wrong. They already have heard what's right or wrong on that. 
but that our care for you, the church at Corinth, in the sight of God might appear unto you. In other words, for the sake of the church and its testimony, you guys need to deal with this. That's why I wrote to you. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort. As they got right with God, they sensed his presence. And exceeding the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. For if I have boasted of anything to him of you, that these guys are serious about God, I'm not ashamed. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, has found a truth. But we're supposed to be in chapter 2, so let's go back to the beginning of this digression. So now you understand why he says in verse 14, now thanks be to God. He wrote a difficult letter. He was worried how it would be received, and thank God they understood what he was saying. Now thanks be unto God, which always, like that, always causes us to triumph in Christ. Did you know the Romans love parades? They love them. And thankfully, because they love them, that's actually helped us with history. What do you mean? When Titus, Vespasian's son, sacked Jerusalem 70 AD, they come back after dealing with Masada, 73 AD, they come back, they have a big parade. So you have the conquering emperor general, then you have his elite, you know, his top officers, then you have your elite soldiers, then you have the other soldiers, and then you have the spoil or the booty from the campaign. And as they were marching in the Rome with Titus, they put on the arch in stone the menorah, the lampstand, that they took back to Rome. At the end of that procession are the prisoners, the hostages, just to prove we've dominated these people. So here come our hostages. We bring them, the captives of war. And those hostages get marched in and, and eventually get down to the Colosseum. And most of them are either thrown to the wild beasts to fight them in the arena or the gladiators. They're the entertainment. This is why when Paul says elsewhere, we're made a spectacle to the world. He's basically talking about, we're the guys at the end of the line of the parade. You guys are glorying. We're headed, for, we're headed basically for persecution and trouble. But we have heaven. So here again, a parade that he talks about. Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. He's leading the way. We are with him. We are the reward, ultimately, the spoil he's pulled out. And so, triumph in Christ, he's make it, making manifest the savor. That's not savior, that's savor, aroma. <coughs> making manifest the savior of his knowledge by us in every place. Well, what do you mean? Verse 15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, and them that are saved, and them that are perished. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto, unto life. I've always wanted to do a sermon at some point. Maybe I will. Yeah, you don't really do sermons. You just kind of run through the word. True. You don't have three points. True. You kind of end where you want. Well, it's really the clock, but true. But if I did, three points, say what you're going to say, teach the word, tell them what you said, and all that great stuff. This section of scripture, chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, it would be titled, How Do You Stink? <laughs> By Pastor Chris. You have an aroma as believers. Let me explain. You're at work, you know, whether water cooler or meeting. Somebody goes off on a tirade. They stop dropping a bunch of F-bombs, GDs, and everything else. And as they're doing all that, their peripheral vision catches you, and they go, oh, hey, man, I'm... Oh, you've been through How many have been through it? Raise your hand. Show the rest of the people. Yeah, there you go. You smelled like Jesus. In our world, just ain't good. They start going off on something like, wait a minute, the believers here, right? Like, oh, you know, the joke like, yeah, what are you guys talking about? No, nothing, you know, because the believers here. And then their parents get sick, and guess who they look, for, for, look to for first for prayer? The believer. Or when the Middle East blew up, guess who they wanted to talk to? The believer. I told you they would ask you, is this Armageddon? How many got asked? Two. That's it? Do people get out? Do people have jobs? <laughs> Everywhere you go, you have an aroma. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that when they see your good works, they'll glorify your Father in heaven. Everywhere you go, you have an aroma. 
Now, if you're claiming Christ, but you're totally compromised, they're like, Pfft. Conversely, you meet another believer somewhere, somehow, travels, whatever. You may not even be able to speak the same language, but you figure out that you both know Jesus. And there's this joy between you, even if your communication is quite limited, because there's that aroma of Christ. We know we've been called from darkness to light, and one day we'll understand each other in heaven. So, we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. And them that are saved, that's sozo, salvation, not, not savor, saved. And them that are saved, and them that apolumai, are destroying themselves is the idea, perish or to destroy. One or the other, you've got an impact if you're walking with Jesus. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Question, are there problems today with churches corrupting the word of God? Yes, there are. So I even did a little list here just to remind myself. Number one, they've been around for a long time. Uh, the prosperity nuts, as I call them. I have a little folder that says nuts. And I've got some different teachers in there and some of their theology and the point in naming them. Usually, if you have any discernment, you can pick them out within mm, two minutes. But the prosperity nuts who are out there who basically make it sound like, you know, God's like a casino machine. Just say the right things and pull the right lever and ch -ch 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 and he's going to have to do what you say, and you hit the jackpot because you have faith in your faith. Where'd you get that from? The Bible says we're to have faith in God. Your faith in your faith, what? Without faith, it's impossible to please God, Hebrews eleven six. He that comes to God must believe that he is, that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. My faith's in God, not in my faith, but they've built entire theological houses on it. It gets pretty corrupt when you get to the extremes of their theology. That's one place. They've watered it down. Oh, I should tell you what it is. We are not as those which corrupt the word of God. The idea is to dilute or to adulterate or to water down. They're using it for their own purpose. Another one that's out there, some people are going to get upset, but I'll say it. The social justice crowd. We're doing social justice stuff, but, oh, we forgot to tell them about Jesus. Or we're doing social justice stuff, and yet we won't tell them what Jesus actually said about certain things in their lives. Because we don't want to offend them. Wait a second. So you're feeding them, or you're housing them, or you're helping them, but you're not telling them about Christ. So you've just made them a little more comfortable before they drop into hell. How are you helping them? Another group that's out there. The kingdom now crowd, if you encounter them, the kingdom now crowd is the church is going to get so, like so dialed in, so on fire, so good, we're going to bring the kingdom down. Take it all over. Uh, gee, when I read scripture, it says there's a falling away just before he removes his church or whatever's restraining. And in Revelation uh, chapter 3, the last letter of the last church, which is not only a church, but we think is a church age as well. Jesus is on the outside of his church, knocking on the door. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open, I'll come in. You open, he comes in. He's writing to a church. It's become inconvenient to have Jesus around because what he said might offend people, so we'll just push him out and keep going. That's some of those who dilute the word of God. Then there's another one that's really rearing its head, and that's replacement theology. What's that, like a replacement set of silverware? What are you, what are you talking about, replacement theology? That is, they claim Israel is no longer a concern to God. God is finished with Israel, and now the church has become spiritual Israel. Huh. Um, well, then why are they back in the land? Why after, say, 2,000 years, 70 AD to 1948, they were scattered? You brought, well, if you're done with them, why would you bring them back? And when they returned to the land, the land does, as Zacchaeus, Ezekiel 36 and 37 said, the Jews regather, and then you begin to multiply fruits and flowers and trees, as it said, and like dried bones, the Jews are scattered. The language is mostly out of use. It's been revived. They've been brought back. They've got nine million of them now sitting in the land of Israel. And surrounding them are a place called Iran known as Persia, Libya, Russia, Togama or Turkey, and part of North Africa who all hate them and want to wipe them out. Why would you tell us you're going to bring them back, do all this, and then these guys are going to attack if you're done with them? And two out of three are in place. 
Well, because, you know, Matthew 24, I mean, you know, but for the elect's sake, those days are shortened. Listen, if you confuse or conflate the church in Israel, pretty soon you think you've got the church in the tribulation. But if that's the case, why in Revelation 20, when they finally have that, that resurrection, who would not take the mark of the beast, would not bow down to his image, would not take or worship the number of his name and all that, why is it they're called tribulation saints and not ecclesia church? How do you get this special class if the church is in it? See, once you get this messed up, you know, God actually has elect Jews. How many of you didn't know that? As well as elect Gentiles. And whoever is during that seven-year period of judgment who realizes Christ is the Savior, as all hell is breaking loose around them, just as it says, they're tribulation saints. You get this messed up, and you, you can't interpret a lot of things from Scripture. But for whatever reason, they're not boycotting Israel, doing whatever. Yeah, there are a lot of things I think are very sad happening in Gaza as well as Israel. But, hey, let's remember how we got here. And you have to deal with it. That's all part of people watering down the word of God. See, it's having God on your terms. Well, let me show you. Turn to 1 Corinthians 6. Most of you guys weren't here for that on Wednesday night. So let me show you where Paul basically just shoots them straight. And as he's shooting them straight here, he is speaking to Corinth, who is under Roman rule, where you have Roman emperors who are in active homosexual lifestyles as emperors. You've got open idolatry with debaucherous worship. You've got drunkenness. All these things are accepted. Corinth is a town that has all of this with no Judeo-Christian foundation at all. So it is Vegas with no conscience on steroids. And he says to him in chapter 6, verse 9, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. What does that mean? Don't be deceived. I know I had to spell that out, but... Be not deceived, neither fornication, that's pornos, fornication, sexual activity, basically anything, think about it, sexual activity, nor idolaters, with idolatry went sex worship, fornication, especially in Corinth, as elsewhere, nor adulterers, those are those who are married but having sex with someone outside of their marriage, those are adulterers, nor effeminate, that is those who allow themselves to be used essentially for homosexual or behaviors of such, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That's a long title for arsenicote. Arsenicote comes a sodomite, active homosexual lifestyle. List doesn't stop, nor thieves, I won't ask how many of you were, nor covetous, nor drunkards, I was one of that drunkard, nor revilers, those are basically hooligans, go out and cause all kinds of problems, railers, nor extortioners, these are people who basically are like wolves, shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty straightforward. Note this, and such were some of you. Before I got engaged and all that and got married and everything else, I was previously a fornicating, drunken, adultering thief. I was dying inside. And I met through reading the word that if I want to have eternal life, I've got to repent. Not be regretting. Metanoia, repent. And of all things, sitting in a, in a bathtub in a shower on a Friday morning, I said, okay, look, I, I know you're at the door knocking, and now how far I got now. If you're willing to forgive me, then I'm, I'm yours, I'm in. The next day, I broke up with the girl I was dating. I was never drunk in again. No more trouble with all the other stuff that went with it. My life changed not because of what I've done. My life changed because I finally laid hold of Jesus by faith and through the Holy Spirit gave me the power to literally not only change mind and walk away, but gave the power to stay away. And he will do that for you. But it starts with you opening the door as he knocks on your heart. If you're in the room, he's knocking. You're in here for whatever reason, he's knocking. But he doesn't do home invasions. He doesn't kick doors open and go, sit down, get safe. He comes in when you open. You have to have the courage to actually open the door and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We're in Leviticus now on Wednesday nights. You thought it would be here. It's Wednesday nights. We got through the first three chapters. You bring your sacrifice as the offer. Here's what you have to do. One, you got to lay your hand on its head. You're identifying with that sacrifice. 
And in some cases, you're confessing your sins or whatever. You lay your hand on its head. You do that. Next, you who brought it, cut its throat. And the blood gets collected and poured into a bowl. The priests then take it sprinkled around the altar. In cutting its throat and pulling out the blood, which atones for you there at the altar, you have caused its death. You caused its death. Because the wages of sin is death, Scripture mentions repeatedly. You will die in the day you sin. They then take, in the case of a burnt offering, cut the whole animal up, everything but the blood goes on the altar. They take that animal, you put your hand on that's taking your place, and they put it on the fire. It shed its blood to atone for your sins. It died because of your sins, and it's being put on fire, which is what you deserve from your sins. It is your substitute. And you paid for it, and you brought it. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whomsoever believes in him will not perish but receive everlasting life. His blood pays your sin. His death paid the wages of your sin. His resurrection proves he'll forgive you your sin. And like the person at that tabernacle who laid his hand on the animal and all this went on, they left free. You leave forgiven. But you have to go beyond regretting some things you do to repenting of what you do. You do that, you open your heart, suddenly your life changes. And I can tell you on personal experience, if you let him, he will totally change you. You gotta surrender. So, we're not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, I said the first service, you know, Swanson, you keep preaching like this, you'll be down to one service. I said, well, we'll have parking. <laughs> it's all how you look at it. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> We're not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity. Interesting word. The idea is kind of behind it, pure or translucent. Sincerous in the Latin, sin without serous wax or filling. You make a vessel, you make a vase, you get a little imperfection, you take a little wax, you know, think of it as like cover up. You put it on, you paint it, and it looks great. But the person who buys it goes and holds up the sunlight. When they hold up the sunlight, guess what they see? The imperfections. In other words, put all the light you want on us, you won't find any blemish. You won't find any corruption. We are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God. And in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Well, we're out of time, so let's uh, stand, let's pray, but what a book. Lord, I pray for anyone here, number one, that does know you, but they are compromised. They've been trying to have you on their terms. And if they're really honest, what they've found is a profound emptiness while trying to rationalize what they're doing. They know too much of your truth to, to enjoy living in darkness, but they're too much in darkness to enjoy your word and your truth. How I ask that you would work in them, bring them to a place where they realize, Lord, you're the one who's supposed to be in charge. Give them the grace to turn away from it, Lord, and walk in a way that's pleasing to you. Lord, I also pray for anyone that doesn't know you. Be not deceived. You're not alone if that's you. We were all deceived. And then God interrupted our lives. So if that's you today, be not deceived. You want forgiveness, you want eternal life, you want love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, kindness, self-control, these things flowing in your life, then turn around. He has been waiting for you since before you were born. Thank you, Lord, for your word in Jesus' name. Amen.